This is Dimitri Lascaris for The Real News. In January of this year, a controversy erupted around Donald Trump's plan to block nationals from seven predominantly Muslim countries from coming to the U.S. Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau decided to strike a more welcoming pose. One way in which he did that was to tweet to his nearly 800,000 followers the following message. To those fleeing persecution, terror, and war, Canadians will welcome you, regardless of your faith. Diversity is our strength. Trudeau's message was retweeted over 400,000 times and liked over 1 million times and was widely reported in the mainstream media. But in the past few days, articles have appeared in the Canadian press questioning whether Canada's policies toward refugees are really all that more welcoming than those of the United States. Now, one of those articles appeared in the CBC Canada State Broadcaster, and it was entitled, Trudeau Should Probably Stop Telling Desperate Refugees That Everyone Is Welcome in Canada. The article stated, Armed with the fallacious belief that Canada will absolutely offer them residency, many asylum seekers will gamble all their money and risk their lives trying to make the dangerous journey to Canada. But of course, many refugees will not find a home in Canada, even if they are guarded temporary asylum or granted temporary asylum. According to data supplied by the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada, out of the 15,196 in-country refugee applicants processed in 2016, a mere 4,970, a total of 4,970 were rejected for various reasons, such as applicants not being considered in enough danger in their own home country. And that was only after hundreds of other applications had already been terminated because the applicants had criminal records, abandoned claims, and so forth. All of this raises a question. When it comes to Canada's interactions with the rest of the world, how different is Canada really from the United States? Now here to discuss this with us is Eve Engler. Eve is a Montreal-based activist and author. He has published eight books, including Canada and Africa, 300 Years of Aid and Exploitation, The Ugly Canadian, Stephen Harper's Foreign Policy, and The Black Book of Canadian Foreign Policy. Thanks for joining us, Eve. Thanks for having me. So a few weeks ago, Eve, I had an off-the-record conversation with a retired Canadian diplomat uh, who had once served as an ambassador in the Middle East. I asked him whether Canada had a foreign policy that was truly independent of the U.S. And uh, I won't repeat all that he said, uh, but I can sum it up by saying that he basically laughed at me, or at least at the suggestion that Canada might have a foreign policy that is truly independent of U.S. foreign policy. And I'd like to explore this question with you and ask you in regard in particular to three key foreign policy issues, um, namely uh, the war on terror, the climate crisis, and the conflict between the state of Israel and the Palestinian people. With reference to those three key foreign policy issues in particular, what are the main similarities and the main differences, if any, that you can see between uh, Canadian foreign policy and U.S. foreign policy? Well, with the war on terror, the Canadian government has uh, quite, uh, certainly since 9-11, has clearly in many different ways aligned uh, Canadian policy with U.S. policy. The best example of that, of course, was the war in Afghanistan, where about 40,000 Canadian troops fought over uh, over a bit more than a decade uh, alongside U.S. troops. Canadian troops were there right in the get-go, and from October 2001, uh, there were Canadian special forces on the ground working with U.S. and British special forces. Uh, so I think the war on terror, there has been pretty, uh, pretty strong alignment, notably in Afghanistan uh, um, and elsewhere. With regards to climate, uh, the climate question, uh, the Canadian business class uh, very clearly says it can't. We, you know, we can't act on reducing our greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, unless we have some sort of accord with the U.S. Uh, uh, with the U.S. because you know our economies are so integrated, and therefore it's you know it would be at a competitive disadvantage if if we were to you know bring in uh, carbon taxes or you know other measures that would limit uh, uh, carbon emissions that, you know, while it wasn't simultaneously taking place for U.S., uh, you know, business competitors. Uh, I think that's largely sort of a, uh, just a justification by corporate officials that don't want to uh, to move forward on these matters. There's all kinds of ways of move, moving forward and reducing carbon emissions without, um, you know, having much of an impact really on, on, on you know, on business or, you know, directing energies to, to, to businesses that are less carbon intensive um, that you know becomes basically justification for continuing extraction of the tar sands and the like um, but you know there's a you know a kernel of, of truth to that question 
Uh, on the question of Israel-Palestine, I think that if you look historically, Canada's uh, foreign policy in terms of supporting Zionism pre-state Israel and, and you know, supporting the state of Israel um, since 1948 um, has been in, in the central um, explanatory factor in Canada's pro-Israel policy has been the fact that Washington, um, you know, has been pro-Israel. And uh, there's many examples you can look into. You can look into Canada's role in, in the creation of Israel and the partition plan in 1947 at the UN, where Canadian diplomats, notably Lester Pearson, uh, actually even stated, we're, we're, we're not going to you know, express an opinion until we've had an opportunity to consult with, with American diplomats at the United Nations. Um, so on that question of, of, uh, of, uh, of Palestine, there is, uh, Canada's relations to the U.S. have been an important um, uh, explanatory factor in, in the pro-Israel policy. Now, now, in recent memory, Eve, uh, there has been at least one major divide between Canada and the U.S. on an important foreign policy issue, and that is namely, in 2001, uh, Canadian Prime Minister Jean Chrétien rebuffed George Bush's request uh, that Canada... Dimitri, 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 2003. I'm sorry, 2003, that's correct. And, and, and as many will recall, uh, Germany and France also refused to participate in that invasion. Do you regard that as proof uh, that Canada does, in fact, have an independent foreign policy, or is that more the exception rather than the rule? And if so... Why, why in that particular case did Canada go its own way? Uh, well, in, in you know, the Chrétien government in 2003 did not join the Bush administration's coalition of the willing that, uh, that invaded Iraq. Uh, that's not to say that Canada wasn't involved in an invasion of Iraq. Um, there's, there's people have suggested, and I think correctly, that Canada was probably the fifth or sixth biggest participant in the war in Iraq. Uh, so, for instance, um, the there were Canadian government. There was Canadian naval vessels patrolling off the coast of Iraq, and actually, the Canadian government had um, legal opinion that Canada was was legally at war uh, because it was enforcing blockade, uh, naval blockade of Iraq. Um, Canadian general oversaw thirty five thousand troops in Iraq. Uh, Walter Nadezink, who later becomes the uh, the chief of the defense staff, he was in charge of uh, tens of thousands of troops, of international troops in Iraq. There were Canadian uh, troops that were um, training with American units uh, that fought in Iraq. Uh, other countries that didn't part participate in the coalition of willing, they withdrew their um, uh, their uh, uh, troops that were training with U.S. U.S. units at the time. Uh, uh, Canada pumped in a whole bunch of aid money into Iraq right after the U.S. invasion that was very much designed to sort of uh, consolidate the U.S. invasion. Um, so the, but that, that's not to say that the Croatian government didn't do the thing that the Bush administration wanted above all else, which was the giving, uh, giving international diplomatic legitimacy by explicitly saying that Canada was, you know, part of the coalition of the willing. Um, and that was entirely explainable by the anti-war movement in this country, mostly in Quebec. There was demonstrations. I was at those demonstrations in Montreal in minus 20 degree uh, uh, temperature where there was 150 to 200,000 people. There was two demonstrations that, that reached into that, you know, into that range. Um, there was uh, all kinds of groups organizing, you know, actions. I was part of a group uh, that was organizing actions at the U.S. consulate, trying to shut the U.S. consulate down, and stuff like that. Um, so, so the the it's it's basically, I think the Iraq War tells us a lot. Canada's position in the Iraq War tells us a lot about about the question of independence. The reality is, the Canadian military is so intertwined with the U.S. military at this point that it's almost impossible for U.S. Uh, to go to war somewhere and Canada not to be part of it in in some way, even when the political leaders say that we're not uh, not supportive of it um, so I think that says some and that says something about you know resistance to Canadian foreign policy in the case of Iraq where there was massive resistance we were able to have a partial victory in not you know officially joining the coalition the willing um, but the, the the fundamentals of Canadian military policy being tied into US military policy are so so strong that you know we, we aren't strong enough we weren't strong enough the anti-war movement to you know stop still a form of Canadian complicity uh, um, to that to, to that war well thank you Eve uh, this is Dimitri Lascaris talking to Eve Engler Canadian author and activist about Canadian foreign policy uh, that concludes our first segment in our second segment, we're going to look at uh, the attitude of Canada's traditionally social democratic party and the governing liberal party towards foreign policy, uh, and in particular, 
whether they are prepared to uh, consider uh, uh, foreign policies that depart significantly from U.S. foreign policy. Uh, this is Dimitri Lascaris for The Real News.